Our next speaker aspires to be the first urban interaction designer. Please welcome Rachel Jaffe. So, who here has ever been to a planning commission meeting? Raise your hand. Okay, for those who haven't been, you should know that the main topics discussed there revolve around education, safety, and access to good jobs. Now, who here has ever smoked pot, drank booze, or had sex? <laughs> Few more people. Now, though, though these topics aren't discussed at planning commission meetings, these are still planning problems. From the high school student who has to go to a college party because there's no spaces open to hang out and meet people, open past 9 p.m. in the suburbs. This is a zoning code issue. To the college student who's drunk in the middle of the city and has to take a $50 cab ride home because there's either no public transportation or this transportation isn't open late. This is both a transportation and a land use issue. By not talking about these topics in planning commission meetings, it disincentivizes young people from becoming a part of the planning process. And this is so important because it's in learning to tackle these smaller problems that you learn how to tackle the big ones. But today, I'm not here to talk about weed or booze. I'm here to talk about sex, and specifically how the technology we use to meet our sexual partners impacts how we think of and design cities. Now, the biggest company on this market is Tinder. Tinder lets users look at the people around them and swipe left to ignore them and right to like them. If both of the people like each other, they can message and then meet up. Tinder is beautiful because it creates these kinds of casual collisions from the sidewalk, and yet by it being a low effort digital technology, it distorts and disshapes these kinds of interactions. For example, Tinder, it makes it harder for people to create this slow kind of trust that you get from seeing someone come back from work on the sidewalk, or having someone hold the door open for you when you're carrying grocery bags. Tinder also takes away these casual excuses, whether it's borrowing a cup of sugar or a cell phone charger, that lets you kind of feel out whether you actually are interested in this person before you go on a date. At the same time, Tinder also sets up these kinds of expectations when you choose one physical location to meet a person in. Uh, the idea of a restaurant sets up this idea of a long-term relationship. This idea of a bar sets up this idea of a casual hookup. It's because of this that it's so important to have flexible spaces like coffee shops and public plazas that gives people more flexibility with the physical form and in turn more flexibility with the kinds of interactions they have with each other. Now, just like Tinder makes it harder for people to create excuses to meet each other, it also is harder to get out of meeting people. This, again, it makes it so important to have these flexible spaces like coffee shops and public plazas because you pay up front. This makes it so if the date is really bad, you can quickly forget to have an appointment and get out of it. If <laughs> If the date's really good, you can stay there and talk for hours. Now, the next part of my research is to understand whether people who use Tinder in cities are more likely to actually meet up with their matches than people who use Tinder in suburbs. Now, the conclusion. What do I want you guys to get out of all of this? First, I want you to begin consciously thinking when you're using Tinder or really any technology. How this technology shapes how you interact with the people and the spaces around you. And most importantly, I want you to understand that you have the power to create the kind of city you want. Whether this is a city with really great public transportation and education systems, or whether this is a city whose residents have really great sex lives. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel.